So the kit system, which is Kawasaki's integrated power valve system. Ridiculous name, but it states what it is. Now, Yamaha were the first company to really introduce a power valve system to two-stroke engines. Um, and obviously there's patents involved, etc, etc, so... Kawasaki and Suzuki and Honda, etc, blah blah blah, couldn't copy the exact um, mechanical operation of their power valve system. But they're all basically trying to do the same thing. And this is Kawasaki's interpretation of that design. So the whole point of a, or the, not the whole point, the whole way, no, the whole point, the whole point of a power valve system is that when you get to higher RPM, the piston speed, its total velocity, not its acceleration, but its total velocity of how many times it comes up and down, up and down to the top of the stroke, um, per second increases. Obviously, the higher RPM the engine is, the faster the piston. Um, is compressing mixture or the more compression events you have per second per minute etc etc so what happens is is that the um, back pressure that comes from the exhaust is determined on the is determined by or defined by the heat of the exhaust gases and the speed of sound so this is a locked physical property the only thing you could do would be to extend or make your exhaust variable and make the length of the expansion chamber variable to change the um, the event, the uh, back pressure event of pushing mixture that's lost out of the exhaust back into the cylinder just before the port is closed off by the piston prior to ignition. So a variable exhaust to keep it sealed etc, although it has been done is quite a difficult um, way to do it. It's quite a difficult method to um, reliably achieve. So what they decided and said is, well, why can't we just increase the port height of the ex of the exhaust? So when the piston comes up, when the piston comes up, if the port ended, just say, oh, this is silly, but just say it ended here and there. See. So the port ended here, and there is where the back pressure timing comes in. The piston's already closed the port. So if you could extend the port so the gases at higher RPM can get in there, all is good. However, the problem comes in is if you extend the height of your exhaust ports, what happens is, is at low RPM, especially when you're trying to create high torque um, in the back end of the wheel, the exhaust gases come in and the, 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 the timing of the back pressure is too, is too quick. So it comes in and the piston is still coming up, it's not timed perfectly, and it ends up going back out. The pressure inside the cylinder pushes it back out. So now you're losing low end torque, but you're increasing high end power and torque. So they need a way to, open, to expand the exhaust port so it's smaller and lower down in um, the low RPM regions but increases height in the higher RPM regions. So what you do is you cut a big port and it's sexy pen time. Let me get a, oh god we've got crap all over everything. Let me get a piece of paper and I'll be back with you. So what happens is you have your cylinder wall And this is the norm, and you have your exhaust port, and what you have is at low RPM, um, this is where you want the port to close. But at high RPM, the engine's going so quick that by the time the exhaust um, back pressure and all the uh, uh, fuel air mixture that's been ejected by the cylinder comes back, this is your port timing, this is where you want your exhaust port to be. Well, we're already closed by now, this hole doesn't expand to that band. So what we need to do is we need to cut the exhaust port to here. But again, you're missing this optimal line here. So like I said, you start re-squeezing out, if you want to put it that way, 
um, at low speed. So this is our low speed line and this is our high speed line. So what they do is is they say well how can we have a port that increases size? So from a side perspective, a cross section, there's your port. And what they do is they add an extra section of material, basically like that. Not like crude, but this needs to be retractable at higher RPM. And that's exactly what they do. It's basically a, uh, a movable window. So, if we put that to one side, the way this is done is Yamaha have their version um, which was very successful, especially in the motorbike racing. And you can actually see it. Now, the reason why they call this is an integrated system is because the Yamaha, the Yamaha system, um, is operated off the throttle cable. Um, so when you increase the throttle, obviously the engine RPM increases, and you um, that is what opens and closes this this window, this power valve. With this system. Um, this is an integrated system, so it's basically not to do with control, manual control. And because what you can do is with the Yamaha system, is you can adjust it. You adjust the cable tension, etc., etc., when the when the power valve activates and when it doesn't. Where this this is integrated into the system, and this runs off actual crank RPM. So is it a better system? Pff, you know, it's chicken and the egg type thing, or it's just a matter of opinion. Um, this is a lot heavier, a lot more complex, so it's a lot more expensive, but it is um, driven directly by the uh, crankshaft RPM. So how does this system work? Well, I have the cylinder, this, our clutch cover, a speed governor, and certain aspects of the piston. So this is the KIP system, so you can see what they mean by integrated. Um, it's completely integrated. You can't separate it. You can disengage it, but you can't separate it. It's not a separate individual piece that's added on just to a cylinder. Um, so, the way it works, and we'll use the governor first. So, call this one side. so this is um, a very old-fashioned piece of technology. This is a speed governor. Let's bring you in. So this is a speed governor. So the way this works is this is, and we saw this um, in a previous episode, where this runs off the crankshaft um, at a one to one ratio so this needs to know the speed and then what you have is you have a spring and you have um, a, a guideway just like you do for your uh, gears and your selectors for your gears and your selectors for your movable gears and then in here you have a centrifugal um, weights and ramps. This works very much in a sense like the variators on um, 50cc mopeds etc. So what you do is you have this dish section, you can see the shape of it here. This is a, dis a, dish a dished section of steel and then you have the ramps on top and basically there's balls inside. And what happens is, is as this spins you can see it move. You can see that move. So as this spins um, the balls fling out due to cent uh, centrifugal force, not centripetal, centrifugal force. And because there's not enough room, and we're back to the paper again, because there's not enough room inside, the balls um, apply a force. So, that's, don't know which way the side of the page. So, what you have is you have your dish section, like so. You have a cross section of your ramps, like so. And you can't see. Where are we? Where are we going? There. And then you have these balls that fit inside, basically just like rollers or ball bearings. And I think the rollers, I have to check, but I think the rollers. And what happens is, is when you, and this is your center line, So when you fling this thing out, the, the mass of the ball causes it to move outwards in this direction, just like um, swinging a conker on the end of a piece of string or whatever. And this 
pushes here and here and because this section here is attached to a spring it applies a force in this direction like so. So as this flings out this gap is smaller than the, the free gap in here and this, this is solid so this pushes this down and this is speed dependent, this is RPM dependent obviously the faster the ball spin the further they go out the more force that they have due to the mass so this spring determines oh, there we go. This spring determines how much speed is required to up for these balls, the outward centrifugal, centrifugal force, to overpower this spring. So if you change this spring for a lighter spring, this valve system will kick in early. If you put a tougher spring, it will only come in at the very higher RPMs. And there's this um, guide rail inside here for where this, uh, where this, well it's not actually a fork, it's just a little... Uh, well, it's actually a bar that sits in here, and I'll show you that in a second. But as these balls spin outwards, like I stated, the whole thing is it's very hard to do. It takes a lot of force. Pushes out, and this this basically moves um, this way, the, this way, the higher the RPM. So this is what you call a, a, it's not a speed governor, but it's very much like a speed governor. And um, so basically all you're doing is you're turning, you're turning rotational... Um, angular momentum, if you want to put it that way, to uh, linear movement and this is governed by this spring, this tension of this spring and the mass of the balls inside of rollers, which you can hear flapping around a bit. And then there's a pin in there to stop this flying out um, because this whole thing needs to spin etc. So where does this fit in? Well on this casing, where this originally came from when we did the disassembly, you have, let me get this right, bloody hell fire. So you have this bearing here, where the end of the shaft sits in, and then you have this bar here. And this bar has this arm attached to it. So what happens is, is that this bar sits in there like so. And if I hold it still, or try and hold it still, if I move this lever, you can see it tries to pull the whole thing out. But obviously this whole thing's trapped. So if I, it's very hard because I don't have enough force to, so what happens is, is as this spring moves in closer towards, as this guide moves slow, closer towards the crankshaft, it moves this bar, and this bar moves in this fashion. So that's low RPM, that's high RPM, like so. And because that's um, on a shaft, you get this little lever pivot arm here which has got a little pin stuck in it and that little pin it's quite complicated that little pin goes to a, a similar I'll have to zoom you out goes to a similar mechanism on this side which again is a another guide on a shaft so what we'll do is we'll take this off this cover and this plastic cover is literally just to stop crap and grit and stuff and that's why you have the rubber boot on the other section because um, it needs to be able to move loops anyway. it needs to be able to move does the rubber boot because this arm's flapping backwards and forwards which is RPM dependent so we take this crap cover off so the crap getting in and inside we have this little pin moves in this fashion. Now I'll bring you, you might be able to see, I, I don't know from this distance, you might be able to see all these little rods, all these little shafts here rotating. You might not be able to, you might be able to. But the cool bit is uh, the window inside, which I'm going to have to bring you in to show you, so bear with me. So, excuse the, the handshaking etc, because I'm trying to do this one-handed. But I'm pushing this rod pulling this rod, sorry, in and out as you can see there and you can see the window inside so that's low RPM that's high RPM and anywhere in between so you can see how that works how this works is just a me mechanical wonder, I do love it and the best thing 
is if I'll tell you what, we'll put the cylinder upside down, it's easier to see. Inside here, as you move it, you can see there's a hell of a lot going on. There's this little back window here, so the concave section. Come on, focus. There we go. The concave section there drops. This top, and this is upside down, so this is at the top. This top paddle there then falls, so it's all smooth, so the port's nice and smooth inside. You can also see these little chambers at the side, they close. Which are like which are basically boost ports. So they're closed at low RPM and open up and increase with higher RPM, like so. So it's actually a really cool mechanism. If you actually see that little window there, it actually rises and falls as well, it's not just I've got it stuck there. You can see as it rotates it rises. So that's an awesome bit of kit. And then there's another one at the other side. Just like that. If I did if I had two ones I could show you a bit better. So it's an awesome thing. So how does all this work? 